the Midwest Art Conservation Center is located in Minneapolis. It's been there for over 30 years. We're housed and have been from the beginning in the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, which is a, a fabulous arts organization, a beautiful museum. If you've never been there and you happen to be in Minnesota, do stop by and see it. Um, this is a regional art conservation lab, and it's a very old model. It goes back to the early 50s. Um, in the 50s, there were very few professionally trained art conservators. So this concept of a regional art conservation lab was developed, where a lab would have a membership of, art, of cultural institutions, art museums, historical societies, universities, churches, you know, whatever organization, not-for-profit not organization that might have, a collection could be a member of the organization. Well, this model persists all these years later, uh, over 60 years later. We have quite a large staff. We have two paintings conservators, two objects conservators, two conservators who work exclusively on um, works of art on paper, a textual conservator, and we also have an educational department that goes out into the field and uh, helps smaller institutions with their uh, many problems of storage, of exhibition, of administration, um, of registration. So it's a very active lab. Um, we have now over 200 institutional organizations and no lack of work. We also do work for, for private individuals and corporations. Here's a little photo of our paintings lab, nothing high tech. Um, it runs like a little, a little boat, everything in its place, um, nothing, uh, nothing sitting around that we don't use because we don't have the space. Space, the final frontier, if you have it, you'll fill it. That's the right there. <laughs> now this is typical of what my colleague David Marquis and I do every day. Smaller, I mean this little painting that I'm showing you now, which is uh, from 1830, it's a German, um, bridal portrait. It would have been accompanied by a portrait of the woman's groom. Um, it's 12 inches by 12 inches. And while it was very, very small, it had, it needed, as David and I call it, everything. It needed everything. You can see a horrible discolored varnish, a great rent through the face, another tear down in the bodice, flaking paint in the lower uh, right corner. I mean, it was. This is more typical of our work. Another example of an easel painting. This is uh, quite large. It's probably 35 by 25 inches. A uh, really stunning landscape by a Canadian artist. This is from about the 1850s, 1840s. Um, his name was uh, Lumens, Charles Lumens, uh, worked exclu not exclusively in Canada, but, but extensively in Canada and the United States. Uh, turns out he had two families, one in both countries. So there was reason to work on both sides of the border, but a fabulous thing, as we see in this. You know, this is what we do. But we also have a long history of working on murals. Here I am on a little scaffold, a fairly modest scaffold in a, a small little Catholic church in, um, oh, about the middle northeastern area of Minnesota. Um, a little apse which was very badly damaged by a leaking roof. And once we made sure that roof was sound, we went in and restored uh, a little murals. And, the little, the little bit at the top, uh, the, the figure of God in the firmament uh, with the Holy Spirit uh, represented over him, uh, was gold leafed, well, maybe metal leafed, and someone had scrubbed off all of the little, it had been metal leafed, and then, then the artist had gone in and made little mosaic squares, just the paint. It was an illusion, of course, but someone had gone in and scrubbed off all of the little we restored that. There was just enough evidence to connect the dots. So those, those projects are, are very, very interesting because there are problem solving on a scale that we don't normally get with the stuff we can carry around uh, by ourselves. Uh, David and I have always enjoyed doing mural work. 
which of course brings us to the John Stewart Curry murals and biochemistry. They're wonderful murals, and they are meaningful on many, many levels. Uh, this is sort of a working shot that a, a photographer from one of the newspapers took, but uh, kind of dramatic. Uh, you're looking at the mural in the uh, foyer, which we'll see in a little while. Um, this is during the last stages of the project. So what brought conservators to a major project at the University of Wisconsin at the biochemistry department. Now, obviously there are murals, but there were two reasons why we were here. And the first was that the university was planning a major, well, the biochemistry department at the university was planning a major expansion of the campus of biochemistry. Very important work has been done in this department over the years, and, and, it, and it continues, and the need for research facilities is constant, I'm sure they would agree with that. Um, and what you're looking at is in the lower left corner is University Avenue. And there's Henry Hall, Mall, excuse me, uh, where, which is lined with science buildings, at least on one side, the 1912 um, building, the Ag Journalism building, Agricultural Engineering, and around the corner on University Avenue, the wing that was added in 1937. The green tree is the old elm, the historic elm out here. And the murals look out over that little courtyard, over the tree. Well, it's now a courtyard because of the biochem edition. Uh, 1997, is that right, Dave? That's the one in the upper left corner. So everything in color is what was added. And the uh, chartreuse and blue uh, up in the corner there, uh, between the old buildings and the 1985 tower, is that beautiful new research tower. It's six stories above ground and four below ground. So you know there's, there's much of this facility that you do not see. In the shell of the 1912-1937 building, all of this was redone. So that's one of the reasons we were here. We were here basically to make sure that the just recurring notes came out the other end of this project in one piece. And it took an enormous team of people to do it, not just the conservators, for my organization. So, the other reason, oh, here's just a, a wonderful photograph of the new tower in the 1937 building and that historic elm tree, which by the way made it through all that construction. Here is a shot of the outside of the 37 building and the murals are on what is called the first floor, but the second floor up above the limestone. Uh, on the right hand side of the doorway at the top of the stairwell right over here is the stairwell foyer the, the big triptych and the accompanying panels and the seminar room uh, is that window right up there those two windows so as Jennifer mentioned John Stuart Curry came here in 1936 as first artist in residence, probably in any university, and is a wonderful photograph of John Stuart Curry and an assistant working on the stairwell foyer. There are a number of wonderful historic photographs which were sort of rediscovered during this, this project. The other reason we're here is not just to protect the murals, but the murals had some condition problems. And they've been treated before. The photograph on the right is a colleague of mine, a uh, person I went to school with in the, in the early 1980s, and who came here with a group of graduate students from the Cooperstown Graduate Program, part of the State University College of New York, to work on the murals. Um, 
uh, with, with a couple of full-fledged conservators working as their supervisors. The murals in 1984 were in horrible condition. They were very badly damaged by mechanical damage, just everyday use, uh, but also quite badly damaged by leaking pipes and plumbing above. Um, there was a, a leak in the foyer below uh, a toilet room. Uh, there was a drinking fountain on the big triptych in the, in the foyer. A lot of the paint had been damaged. There was a lab bench above, I believe it was a lab bench, uh, a sink rather, above uh, the murals in the seminar room. And the conservators in 84 did a fabulous job. We didn't reverse their work. It was so beautifully done. And that's me doing some in painting in 2012 after many years of shepherding the murals through the project that went on constantly around them. Now, a lot of things were done, well, okay, before we get into what we did, who was John Stuart Kerr? Who was this guy? He was a member of a group of, of artists working from about 1920 until about, well, actually one of them, well into the 1970s, called American Regionalists. They were a group of artists who really actively and quite verbally turned their backs on modernism and instead turned inward to the American landscape, American life, and the American theme of, of, of the heartland. And the three components were, that's uh, on, on the right hand side is, okay, there's John Stuart Curry on the left, Grant Wood on the right, and the very man, like, very, quite a tough guy, Thomas Hartbeck down in the lower right. Quite a character. I'm, I'm a great fan of, of all three of them. Grant Wood, I mean, you might not know his name, but you know his art. Uh, this is a little detail from a painting at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. It's it is in its own way, while it represents the heartland and it's you know, very American, it is quite abstract. He had beautiful geometric forms and was a great designer. Now, Brad Wood was born in Iowa. He was a printmaker, a silversmith, a, a teacher. He founded his own school. Uh, he studied in Chicago at the Chicago Art Institute in New York, in Paris. Um, when he met the other two uh, major figures in the movement, um, they, were, they were friends for life. But you know his work, even though you don't think you do. American life. And this is a, you know, I mean, it's an icon of American life. How many times has this thing been spoofed? <laughs> but it's, it's beloved. Uh, if you wish to see it, it's in the Chicago Institute of Arts. It's one of their masterworks. Uh, there's always someone standing in front of this painting when you visit the museum. It's, it's not a farmer and his wife. It's actually a portrait of the artist's sister, Nancy, or Nan, and the artist's dentist. <laughs> the little building in the background is a farmhouse not far from where he lived, and the building still stands. So you can actually go into Iowa and, and, and see the little painting, uh, see the little building that's painted here. Thomas Hart Benton, amazing guy. Uh, he was the most vocal of the three. Um, he dissed modern art in a very big way. He didn't make a lot of friends. But he was an incredibly successful printmaker, artist. He founded a school in, in Kansas City and lived there most of his life. Uh, traveled extensively. He was actually born into a very well-to-do family in Kansas City. Um, he studied in Paris, in New York, in Chicago, just like the other three. It seems that they, although they weren't there quite at the same time, um, Thomas Hart Benton was an unbelievable human figure, but also distilling it down to a very beautiful design and form. His work is crowded with figures. It is a good example. These are the murals at, if you're ever down there, Kansas City, Kansas, 
is the home of the Dwight D. Eisenhower Library. And these are the murals in the uh, lobby of, of that library. And they're just fantastical. I mean, they just entirely surround you. Um, his, his themes were much more political than Grant Wood and Judster Curry. I mean, he depicted the Ku Klux Klan and, and political strife, um, uh, the, the blight of, of Native Americans, uh, slavery, in a way that, to a degree, Grant Wood, and to a certain degree, the Curry did not. Um, Thomas Hart Benton lived, I think, well into the 19th. 70s into his early 80s and late 70s. Uh, an incredible body of work. So our guy, was born in Kansas. And he was a farmer. Although his parents were very well educated and very well traveled, um, he was a farm kid. I mean, he, his whole life was on the farm. And, and I think a lot of his art reflects that. Um, I would describe his work here, a view of the Isthmus capital, right here in Madison, as much more lyrical than Grant Wood's style, and certainly, you know, the tough and rumble kind of like style. Um, John Stuart Curry, again, traveled to Paris, studied with very important painters in Paris in the 19-teens and 20s. Um, he too was a printmaker, a fabulous printmaker. He worked as an illustrator for a newspaper, an illustrator for magazines. Uh, there, he produced many covers for the Saturday Evening Post and Collier's and other magazines um, until he settled into a career as an easel. And his paintings are very powerful. This is a scene Right here in Wisconsin, you know, a wall cloud. I mean, what's more powerful, um, uh, a Midwestern theme? The farmers in the foreground rushing to get the, the, the hay into the, what seems to be a very far away barn, the lightning. I mean, it's, it's an amazingly powerful painting. It's not very large. It's only about 30 inches, by <coughs> 20 inches. Now this painting, I first saw when I was about six years old. I don't know where I saw it, maybe in an encyclopedia or in one of our little textbooks. Um, I didn't know who did this painting for about you know, 50 years. So until I came across it, maybe 40 years, as John Stuart Curry's work. I, this painting scared the living daylights of me as a child. I grew up in the Midwest too, and we did have tornadoes in Michigan. Um, but I, what I loved about this was not the power of nature, but the effect on humans. Here, the family's rushing into the root cellar. Look at the look at the the face of the mother clutching her infant. I mean, she's just ashen. And the kids, of course, what are kids going to do? They're going to grab their pets. The dog, the, the the young lad has the puppies you know, cradle in his arm. And I was always fascinated by the cat who was ready just to take off. You don't see me. I'm a cat. And then I always felt kind of badly for the chicken, but he wasn't a cat. So that's John Stewart Curry. John Stewart Curry. I mean, a, a wonderful, wonderful pair. While Curry was here in, in Wisconsin, he got the commission of a lifetime. It was a mural series at the state capitol of Kansas, his home state in Topeka. And here he is, probably a staged photograph. He's, you know, in a suit. It's probably staged, but painting the major panel of the series. Kansas hated it. They threatened the legislature, threatened to paint it over, to rip it off the wall. They hated every bit of it. And it was a very contentious relationship between the citizens, the legislators, and the artist. Well, I mean, it's a very, very powerful piece. John Brown, the abolitionist, with blood on his hands, a Bible in one hand, a rifle in the other, dead, a dead Union and a dead a Confederate soldier at his feet. 
speak. It's a representation of, you know, of the war. It's, it's the advent of the war. On one side, a tornado, on the other, a prairie fire. Well, the citizens of Kansas had just lived through the premiere of the Wizard of Oz. You know, we're not in Kansas anymore. Uh, tornadoes, the stereotype, they felt that, that Curry was representing them in a way that they felt far more noble than prairie fires, tornadoes, and abolitions. So he stormed out of Kansas. He never signed the murals. And you cannot read a single thing about tourism in Kansas without seeing this mural somewhere in the literature. Kansas is incredibly proud to have these. I mean, they're beautiful. They're, they're masterworks. So times change, but Curry never enjoyed that adulation. I don't think he, I think he returned to Kansas again in a coffin in 1946. He died here in Madison. So it was not a nice relationship. So, in the mean, a little bit later on, after he leaves Kansas, in conjunction with his friends at uh, the Ag Department and the, the Agricultural Chemistry uh, Department, uh, Stuart decided, uh, Stuart, John Stuart Curry decided to do this cycle of, of murals. Now I'm going to show you the before treatment. This is how I first saw the murals. Um, in the floor is a terrazzo floor. It was pretty beat up. Um, the murals had once again, since 1984, yes, my colleagues in 84 did a beautiful job restoring the murals, but nobody fixed the plumbing. So the plumbing continued to leak. And there was a lot of flaking paint, a lot of insecure paint, Staining. So they're delaminated canvas. These are, these are painted on canvas that are glued to the wall. In the foyer, it's a very heavyweight linen canvas. In the seminar room, it's as lightweight as a piece of handkerchief fabric, like a muslin. It's very, very light. So you'll see that the ceiling is painted bright white. Even the little lights that illuminate are painted over. I mean, it's, it's, it's not pretty. So I'll just give you a little tour of what they looked like. Here are the two companion panels. We'll see them in a little bit. Um, you'll notice that Curry is using, let's go back and look at this, he's using a device to tell his tale of light and dark. You'll notice that on the far left and the far right of the triptych, there is a line diagonal line. Here on the right, on the left, is the effect of human, animal, and agriculture without the benefits of biochemistry research. Um, the animals are incredibly sick, the children are, have rickets, uh, the plants are dying. On the right, healthy animals. Um, you know, healthy humans, healthy crops. And in the center, Curry has actually depicted many members of the many, I mean, the scientists and, and professors who worked in the department. And, you know, they're coming out, they're bringing the children into the light, the animals uh, in the background, those beautiful horses. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful composition. The companion pieces, just opposite the triptych, again, the same devices used of dark and light. You can see for yourself the, the healthy animals, the sick and dying animals. Uh, on the right, um, beautiful crops, withering crops. Benefits of biochemistry. Now, the little seminar room is entirely different. It's almost, this is the public art. When you go into the seminar room, it's very intimate. Lyrical, it's it's lovely. Here on one whole wall, the back wall of the seminar room, is this gorgeous landscape of Wisconsin farmland. Um, I don't know how many times I've been in that room when someone comes in and says, 
I know exactly where that is, and they name some place. And then someone else comes in, I know exactly where that is, and they name another place. So it's, it's, it's one of those images that, that people identify with, whether they're right or wrong, that doesn't matter. As you go around the room, you know, the landscape comes around to the two, there are two windows on the west wall. It comes around, I mean, all four walls, it's very beautiful. Um, you'll notice those big, wonderful fluorescent lights hanging down. The ceiling is bright white. Um, and over the years, the woodwork in that room had just been hacked up. Um, so the paneling was taken out, they put in formica panels. I mean, they, they really mucked up. They took out the cork, original cork floor and put in, you know, vinyl tiles, painted the ceiling white. I mean, it, it, it was really, it was very sad. So as we come around the room, the central panel, I don't know what I'm looking at out the window. That's me and the mail on the right hand side. Um, uh, depicting the scientist and the beautiful Wisconsin landscape in America. And we're coming around to the second window. In the corner, suddenly we see a change in the landscape uh, industry. And I want to point out those vertical pipes. Those have been there from the very beginning. John, John Stewart Curry painted around those. Those are part of the, the steam heating plant. Uh, you know, it was there, and you can see that he really didn't even nibble all the way in there and finish his, his landscape. So those two pipes became an important part of the restoration. And the back wall, well, this is very interesting. Uh, you'll see that the waste coating, the bottom section, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's lovely oak. And you can see the panels there. Those are the Formica panels. And then there's this big, blank, open space in the middle of the wall. What is that? Um, when Curry did the murals in the, in the seminar room, there was this big metal box sitting right there. It was an air conditioner. That room faces west, and when that elm tree outside was little and didn't shade that room, the room must have been a furnace. So it was, there was actually a big metal air conditioner there. It is long gone, but the composition very much works around it. And you know, they weren't going to move the air conditioning unit, so Curry painted around it. As you come around the room, the Wisconsin River, lovely little landscape behind the door. And we come around to the doorway and uh, the uh, light switches. And there is the one wall there is occupied chiefly by the long slate and black one. So what did we have to do? You know, they were going to be doing a lot of construction on this site. What did we do in conjunction with the architectural firm, engineering firm FLAD, and the construction firm Finnor, and the great fortune of working with the preservation architect Charlie Kualiana. As a team, what were we going to do to protect these things to make sure they came out the other end in one piece? A lot. First, it started first in the planning phases. We removed all of the plumbing from above all of the murals. You know, this is a major demolition and construction. So if you get these things out on the, you know, on the drawing board, that's the time to do it. So all the plumbing was moved from above the murals. And they put in a sprinkler system, which is code, but it's a dry sprinkler system. So that you know, water isn't sitting in the pipes above it, uh, waiting for that fire to happen for the sprinklers to go off. So we started by covering the murals with a very common material: house wrap, Tyvek, the stuff they put on houses before they put up aluminum siding. That stuff. This happens to be unprinted, but it's the same. Material. It's a very stable material. It's one of the most stable materials around. It's a non-wove material, meaning it's made of many layers of, of uh, synthetic material. It's pretty, you know, it resists water. It's not entirely waterproof, but it's a material that lets vapor 
pass through it. And it's completely uh, inert. It sat on those murals for many years and didn't transfer anything chemical or harmful to the mural. So the first thing was to kind of wallpaper the room in Tyvek. You can see here is that blackboard along the one wall, and we're working our way across the top. Now you see the room semi in a, in a state of demolition. The ceiling is gone. The cove is still there, but the ceiling itself is gone. They've taken up the old tile floor. The Tyvek was then covered with basically a freestanding wall of two by fours over which uh, panels of uh, plywood were placed. So, the, well, the plywood was there to prevent the accumulation of the considerable construction dust and dirt and debris that was flying around for years, but also to act as a mechanical barrier between the world and the murals. It worked very, very well. Uh, here's just a picture in the seminar room looking out. And if you notice, if you look out the door, there's a wall. The entire area was enclosed in a plywood room. So many layers on the murals, and then the whole area was enclosed. So here was this room within the building standing quite independently. It had its own furnace. Um, it was a secure area, a limited you know, movement of the construction guys uh, was fairly limited. And other things happened too, because they planned to remove the roof on, this, on, the, on the 1937 building. So on the floor above the murals, they built an interior roof system so that just in case any water fell from the sky and permeated the, the murals themselves would be protected. Uh, here is that room within the room that was built around the rooms, uh, a large fan just to circulate the conditioned air. Literally, there was a little furnace sitting out in front of the murals in the stairwell foyer. So all of these layers of protection, one after another after another, it was necessary. At one point, something had to be done about the triptych wall and the two accompanying panels in the stairwell foyer. It was found that the wall that the big triptych sits on wasn't really connected to anything on the top. It was sort of this freestanding wall, and there was some movement of the wall. So intervention, structural intervention, was necessary. This is the reverse of that wall. There were these big waste pipes, and you can see the big bump out there, and some of the pipes in place above. Basically, to stabilize the wall, the wall was encapsulated with many layers of resin and fiberglass. I mean, state-of-the-art stuff. And not just the wall of the triptych, but really all the way around the foyer, just to make sure that there wasn't any movement that would adversely affect the murals themselves. It turned out there was a little movement because there, was, there were pre-existing cracks in that wall. And it was from those waste pipes. They basically built the wall around the waste pipes, and they didn't do a very good job. And that weakness transferred to the front of the mural. So basically, any deformation, any movement was frozen at this point. So this an extraordinary amount of care has been given to these things over a very long period of time. Uh, this protection went up in, I think, 2008. Uh, years later. And then, one more view of, uh, of that reinforcement in the stairwell foyer. And then they blew the building apart. This is biochem. 
This is the interior of this building, kind of over there on the lower floor. They took out everything to the exterior walls. Here are my murals sitting up there, and this is what's surrounding it. It was very shocking. <coughs> Here is the space you're sitting in right now. That connection between the 1937 building and the 1912 building, they just blew it up. But they kept the facade wall along University Avenue. Uh, this is sort of when they started construction. I have another photograph. I mean, this is what these buildings look like. I'll show you where the murals are. Okay, here's that center section where we're sitting right now. The second story where that worker is standing, the murals are just a few feet away from that. This is what was going on. Then they decided to blow up University Avenue. And then, and then, <laughs> then they dug a hole to China, right over there, with a new research tower, literally feet away from the murals. And it went on and on <laughs> and on. Here is a view of biochem. On the right-hand side is the 1912 building. There is the facade, that little shell that's standing. And this is the 1937 building where the murals are located. And as you can see, it's just glass. And the, the, the crane in the back is for uh, the research tower. And over the years, the research tower went up. The exterior of these buildings, the historic buildings, were restored, including beautiful new windows, all of the uh, masonry was repointed and repaired. Beautiful new downspouts and gutters. I mean, the exteriors of the buildings, of the historic buildings, are absolutely gorgeous. But, yeah, there's another floor going up on the tower. And you can see 1937 there in the background without any windows, it looks like. I mean, this just went on forever. And here, near the completion of the tower. And about every three months, I travel from Minneapolis here to biochemistry <coughs> to sleet and rain and snow and heat to examine the murals, to make sure that they were coming through in one piece. Every three months, they went on for a very, very long time. So again, just to show the extraordinary level of care. So finally, finally, Construction is to a point where the walls came down and the two by fours came down and we removed the top tie back to actually get to the murals. We came back to restore them. So many years later, but there they were. We were delighted to see how well they looked. First step was to do a technical examination of every square inch under, as you can see, rather punishing light to make sure that the murals you know, were not further damaged to map any problems, basically comparing the condition in about 1912 to, or 2012, 2012 to that of, 19, uh, of uh, 2006, make sure that there were drastic changes. And there were not, not many. We were astounded that it came through. Now, while we're restoring the murals, the room itself was being worked on. You know, electricians. Um, see that lovely blue door? I know that had to be replaced with a, a beautiful oak door. You can see that the wainscoting, the woodwork has not been uh, worked on. The floor is still concrete. The ceiling has been painted this beautiful, warm color and the original color of the ceiling was determined by by doing paint analysis scraping down through the layers and finding the original color and it was amazing having the ceilings painted from that bright white to this beautiful warm color the murals looked brighter more saturated you could actually see the images because with a white ceiling, they're just competing. 
you know, the contrast is so high, it makes a mural look darker. And it was transforming. It was so lovely to see them in that light. You'll notice that there's a little white line below the, the plaster coat. We asked the painters not to paint that because we didn't want them getting anywhere near the mural. So one of the last things we did was get up there with a small brush and finish the cove painting. I mean, it's what we do. We don't, we don't drip paint in my business. So uh, you'll notice that the woodwork is really in a very raw state. That big white box over there, it's still there, you know, where the artist painted around the air conditioning unit. And here is my colleague, Elizabeth Elizabeth Bouchour. Uh, this is during the restoration. You can see the tree outside the window. Um, and a uh, beautiful new replacement window with ultraviolet and infrared filtration that's built right into the glass. Uh, it's not a film, but it's actually part of the glass of the windows. Um, Elizabeth is she has a little palette in her hand and a very tiny brush, and she's in painting small losses. Uh, which brings me a little bit to our, the philosophy of, of conservation. I mean, obviously, do no harm. That's our, that's our goal. Um, but in conservation, anything that we add to a work of art, whether it's an easel painting, a mural, a sculpture, a work of art on paper, must be reversible or pretty darn near, near close. And that's our, that's our master goal, is to use materials that can be removed from the object without harming the object. It also must be detectable by another conservator. To your eye, no. But to another conservator, they should be able to identify the materials that we've added. And the materials that we add should be durable. And we solve this by using mainly synthetic resins that when we in-paint little tiny losses with little tiny brushes, we're using a medium that will not discolor or change chemically with time. So those are our goals. And our, our materials are very much prescribed by uh, our profession. And uh, you know, it's a, we, we very rarely use the same materials that are used in an original work of art idea of the parameters of our This is a close-up of the damage from water. You know, this was very badly damaged before it was restored in 1984. And here's that area in the seminar room above the light switches. Once again, the same area was damaged. And this is our work in uh, filling some losses not only in the mural itself, but also in the cove. This is really before the uh, losses were, were dressed. I mean, we, we put the film material on, but then we very carefully clean it off so it's, it, it's only within the lacuna or the loss um, in the work of art. So this, is, this looks a little sloppy. But here is that same area after in painting. You know, matching very carefully the surrounding colors. And you can see that the cove is yet to be uh, touched up. <coughs> they left us a gallon of paint, so that wasn't very hard. Here is the corner uh, in the seminar room, and you can see the white going up uh, the junction of the two walls. There were quite a few <coughs> losses and separation there, and especially along the top. And there were some losses, uh, especially on this wall here. You can see it's sort of a triangle of loss. Very carefully filled, cleaned away so that it's within the area of loss, and then very carefully toned and then painted so that you know your eye doesn't stop on that damage as you enjoy the work of art. And here's that corner <laughs> where the pipes were. Well. The, the, those steam pipes were removed during demolition because they were no longer functioning. And we had to do something with this corner. Uh, so here it is basically before the treatment. And here you can see some of our fills 
where you know hardware had gone into the wall and through the canvas, the mural, and into the uh, main wall, uh, the supporting wall. And here they're filled and ready for new painting. And you'll see when we go into the seminar room that dummy pipes have been placed there because there were always pipes and the artist painted around them. There's David. David spent his, the entire time we were here working on the murals in the foyer. Uh, there was a great deal of work to be done out there. There was a little bit of delaminating canvas that he had to reattach. Um, uh, and the, it was the foyer that, because it's so public an area, that had a lot of mechanical damage. Um, Elizabeth working on one of the companion panels in the front foyer and the stairwell foyer. And just a couple of befores and afters. Here is the area around the light switches in the seminar room. And you know, this is an area where people reach around and they flip the switches. And you can see that outside edge is just totally chewed up. Lots of mechanical damage. And here it is after restoration. Um, I very carefully saved that light switch plate and kind of tucked it away cleaned it up and put it back up there. And uh, although all the switches aren't in use, I, I worked with the electrician to put in some, some little infills where there weren't actual switches, but uh, wanted to keep that little original detail. Uh, here is the corner by the window, uh, one of the windows on the west wall. Again, an outside corner, pretty beat up. And you can see just a little bit of the beautiful woodwork that was restored around it. You know, really nice job. And the seminar as it is today, uh, a lot of the materials and the design of this room, the, the specifications from 1937 still existed. So they were followed. Beautiful cork floor. Uh, the, the style of the wainscoting was determined in those specs. And here is the solution for that big metal air conditioning unit. Instead, uh, a very nicely designed uh, cabinet in, in oak to match the wainscoting. And let's see. Once again, just to remind you of that horrible stark white ceiling and the and the uh, fluorescent lamps, you can see how they're replaced with period style lamps. The, the room is just long. Wait till you see it. There's just another view. The old radiators, of course, were removed because uh, the HVAC system in this building was completely redesigned and reinstalled. But they sort of put in these dummy radiator covers where the radiators were originally located just to give it that look of a room heated by radio. So, that's the restoration. And I think we should just go and take a look at the bureaus together. Would that be okay? Great.